£145 in tax-free cash. Plus, there's a further £500 of shopping vouchers to spend at your favourite store. We'll also give you a gadget package to use in your garden this spring. That includes a games console, a pizza oven and a portable smart speaker so you can listen to GB News on the go. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, Text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. I'm Martin Daubney. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right. We want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Good evening, it's nine o'clock on television, on radio and online in the United Kingdom and across the world. This is Mark Dolan tonight. In my big opinion, Princess Catherine and the royal photo story that just won't go away. In my view, this is something a lot darker and more concerning than just a blunder. Find out why shortly. Plus, a developing story tonight, as tomorrow's Sunday Times exclusively reveal that the Prince and Princess of Wales will reveal all about Catherine's health issues straight after Easter. I'll get immediate reaction from the Queen of Royal reporting, Kinsey Schofield, shortly. Winning the next general election could fundamentally change what we are able to do. Impressive guy. In the big story, Wales are to have their first black first minister. But will Vaughan Gething undo the damage caused by Mark Drakeford? I'll get reaction to this huge news in Wales and ask what it means for the rest of Britain. And in my Take It 10, Sheffield University today hosted an event entitled How Do You Solve a Problem Like GB News? I'll be dealing with the sinister forces that would love to close this place down. I'll be dealing with them in no uncertain terms at 10 and you won't want to miss it. So two hours of big opinion, big debate and big entertainment. I'll see you after the news headlines and Aaron Armstrong. Thanks, Mark. Good evening to you from the GB newsroom. Sainsbury's has been unable to fulfil the vast majority of today's online deliveries because of technical issues. Contactless payments in store were also affected, leaving thousands of customers either unable to buy groceries or having to queue for cash machines. Sainsbury's says it was caused by an overnight software update. 
Tesco experienced similar problems but on a smaller scale. Both chains have apologised to customers and say the unrelated issues have been resolved. Vaughan Gething has been elected as the next Welsh Labour leader and the new First Minister of Wales. He will become the first black leader of any European country. Mr Gething won a narrow contest against his only rival, Jeremy Miles, taking 51.7% of the vote. He's expected to be confirmed as First Minister on Wednesday when a vote will take place in the Senate. And he will replace Mark Drakeford, who's held the post since 2018. It means no UK nation will be led by a white male for the first time since devolution began in the late 1990s. Today, we turn a page in the book of our nation's history. A history that we write together. Not just because I have the honour of becoming the first black leader in any European country, but because a generational dial has jumped too. Like Ken and Jane, devolution is not something that I have had to get used to or to adapt to or to apologise for. Devolution, Welsh solutions to Welsh problems and opportunities is in my blood. Hamza Yusuf has called on SNP members to make history in the general election by making Scotland Tory free. Addressing the party's campaign council in Perth, Scotland's First Minister claimed most of the country's seats will be a straight fight between the SNP and the Conservative Party. He warned the campaign won't be easy, though, saying our opponents will throw everything at us. The prize for Scotland isn't just this constituency. We have the opportunity to ensure that Scotland is Tory free. Not, not a single Tory MP left in Scotland. Delegates, that is definitely a prize worth fighting for. Rugby Union, Ireland have retained the Six Nations Championship after beating Scotland 17-13 in Dublin. A try from Dan Sheehan gave Ireland a 7-6 lead at half-time and another try in the second half from Andrew Porter looked to have given them breathing space but Scotland hit back through Hugh Jones to set up a nervy finish. Ireland hung on though to win back-to-back -back titles and their captain Peter O'Mahony lifting the trophy in what may have been his last match for his country. Uh, uh, in the other game, or the later game today, France are leading England right now at halftime by 16 points to 10. Uh, more on all of our stories or with our GB News alerts. Uh, scan the QR code on your screen right now or go to our website. Back to Mark. Thanks, Aaron. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. In my big opinion, Princess Catherine and the royal photo story that just won't go away. Plus, a developing story tonight as tomorrow's Sunday Times exclusively revealed that the Prince and Princess of Wales will reveal all about Catherine's health issues after Easter. I'll get instant reaction from the Queen of Royal reporting, Kinsey Schofield. In the big story, Wales are to have, as you've just heard, their first black first minister. But will Vaughan Gething undo the damage caused by Mark Drakeford? Also, is Rishi Sunak about to be sensationally replaced as PM? I'll be asking a former member of the Senate and ex-Tory MP, Neil Hamilton. My Mark Meets guest is one of Britain's brightest comedy stars. The popular actress from The Inbetweeners, the IT crowd, Four Weddings and Casualty, Belinda Stewart-Wilson. In my Take a 10, Sheffield University today hosted an event entitled How Do You Solve a Problem Like GB News? I'll be dealing with the sinister forces that would love to close this place down in no uncertain terms at 10. You won't want to miss it. We've got tomorrow's front pages at 10.30 sharp with three top pundits who haven't been told what to say and who don't follow the script. Tonight, Claire Pearsall, Diana Moran and Sajila Kershey. Yes, folks, it's ladies' night, or should I say, style Saturday. Plus, supermarkets in crisis today. Technical issues have seen millions of Brits lose their Sainsbury's and Tesco online grocery deliveries with branches of Sainsbury's descending into utter chaos as bosses tackle an IT meltdown. Just what's gone wrong at two of Britain's biggest supermarkets. And the most important part of the show. Your emails, they come straight to my laptop, mark at gbnews.com. And this show has a golden rule. We don't do boring, not on my watch. I just won't have it. A big two hours to come. Mark Dolan tonight. 
is your perfect Saturday night in. So why don't you uncork a bottle of something French or Italian, grab a beer or fire up the kettle and let's get to work. And we start with my big opinion. Oh dear, the halo has slipped, or is it the crown? Lady Diana was the people's princess. Kate Middleton was the perfect princess, a discreet, devoted wife, a caring mother, a dutiful public servant. Since she entered the royal family, she really hasn't put a foot wrong. But it's all come crashing down with this wildly photoshopped Mother's Day image. I've got to say, before the veracity of this image was brought into question, it was already raising eyebrows with many, including the excellent broadcaster Julia Hartley Brewer, noticing that Catherine was not wearing her wedding or engagement ring. Now, this was a significant official portrait, an image of members of the royal family on Mothering Sunday. Do you not think she would have put her rings on for that? For a long time now, there has been wild and frankly nasty online speculation about her and William's marriage. I've got no doubt they are blissfully happy and William is a doting and loyal husband. But a ringless photograph of his wife on Mother's Day will be a field day for those seeking to characterise this marriage as having a problem. In my view, that's nonsense, the body language between the couple in public and the smiling faces of their three happy children would suggest the Waleses are fine. But the gossip mongers and conspiracy theorists, far from being silenced by this image, have now been handed an early Christmas present once it was revealed that several major news agencies pulled the photograph over concerns it had been doctored and manipulated. A perfunctory message on Twitter from Catherine herself confirms that she, like many amateur photographers, likes to experiment with editing as she apologised for any confusion caused. Now, I don't know about you, but I certainly brightened up pictures of myself and the family, improved the contrast and tried to make my kids more attractive. Fighting a losing battle on that one. But this Photoshop fail was bizarre, just to scale a bit alone. Why were there so many trees outside in full bloom in March? Part of Princess Charlotte's wrist is missing. In fact, the photograph is thought to feature as many as 16 inconsistencies, including Prince George missing a foot. Surely a unique physical characteristic that would have come to public attention by now, the single-footed prince. And some are even suggesting that Princess Catherine has an Adam's apple. But I seriously doubt she's the first trans royal. But if the palace have nothing to hide, they should publish the original photograph, which we're told was taken by William. But I doubt they ever will, which is why the story will now enter conspiratorial folklore forevermore. In the end, there's a lesson for the royal family and for all public figures. Be straight with us. You take a photograph of the family on Mother's Day and you publish it. The very fact that this image was doctored so comprehensively is a problem for a monarchy that wants to be seen as authentic, real, credible and down to earth. Meanwhile, the questions where is Kate and what's going on with her health will only get louder. Now, if you want my honest view, I don't think that Catherine sat for that photograph. It's my view the whole thing was knocked up on a computer because poor Kate is not well enough for such a photo opportunity. Which is why they should never have released the photo in the first place, whether it's real or not. It's been a pantomime, an insult to the public's intelligence and Catherine's first PR disaster. Frankly, I think that she should be left in peace to recover and to get well. We didn't need this photo and this airbrushed PR nonsense. And do the palace think that we're that stupid? This saga has been a sorry one for the royal family, and the rumours about Kate's health and the Wales's marriage will only intensify. And from now on, how can we believe a photograph that's been released by the palace or a statement that's been made? All that matters is Catherine's health and her recovery. Everything else is just hot air. But this story is going nowhere. A fake image creates the sense of a fake family and a fake monarchy. They say the camera never lies. If only that was true of the royal family. We've just had a snapshot into what they're really like. Sorry, folks. 
I don't think Catherine posed for that photo. That's my view. I could well be wrong. But what's your view? Mark at GBnews.com. I'll get to your email shortly. But first, tonight's top pundits. And I'm delighted to welcome, in no particular order, I'm very excited to have with me, Diana Moran, journalist, fitness expert and model. We've got former government advisor and political commentator Claire Pearsall and broadcaster, comedian, playwright and woman about town, the one and only Sajila Kershi. What a dream team tonight. Well, look, folks, uh, let's sink our teeth into this one. Diana Moran, great to see you. Um, do you think that photograph is kosher? Because I don't think Catherine posed for it. You've actually really surprised me with what you've just said because I had thought that William had taken it. Mm. And I was going to say what a lot of nonsense this all is because I take a lot of photographs and I love photoshopping them and doing all sorts of things. And I probably... You don't need to. You're perfect. And I probably... <laughs> you're, no, not you're, you're me. You're Diana Moran. Not of me. Not oh, of no, me. just <laughs> other, it, less else. attractive members of the family. <laughs> of members. I'm always taking photos. And I'm always doing things right. with them. And that's what I thought until you've just said that. Mm -hmm. That you don't think she was even there. I think that this image is such a botch job that it raises fundamental questions about whether it happened in the first place. And I think it's a matter of national interest that we find out. And that's why I think, Diana, that the palace should publish the original photograph. Well, if there was an original photograph, mm. sounds as if there were lots of photographs, mm. from what you're saying, that have all got put together. So, Gila Kershey, I'm no conspiracy theorist, but I think that what's happened in the last week has raised more questions than mm. it's answered. Luckily for you, I am a little bit. I love a good conspiracy. Well, there's there are many ways you can look at this. So, the fact, like, Princess Diana, if you remember, she used to um, send, like, little messages through photos. Remember that photo of her in front of the Taj Mahal, most romantic, you know, place in the world, and, and she's there alone? And initially, when you see the no ring, of course, like, you think, well, oh, Oh, is she trying to tell us something? Mm -hmm. And then you look at all the terrible botch up jobs. There's like some stunts done by Prince Louis with his fingers, which I don't know how he's got into those positions. As right. you say, all the other little little all, things. All we know is his piano playing days are behind him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And what um, about poor George with one foot, by the well, way? One foot. They, they kept one that foot. quiet. But Apparently you know, he's hopping mad about it. <laughs> the thing is, like, it, it's it. too many mistakes. Well, I blame the press office. I don't care if she posed for it or not. That's not the issue. Why was that allowed to go out as it was? Or is 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 is, is it because she's a princess and so uh, I'm doing my own photos? By the way, if that is your result, stop giving the photos. But I think it's it's the press office fault. Why did they let it Claire out? Claire Pearsall, if the palace were not so PR focused, they would have just left well alone. The message would have been clear. Catherine's not well. She's recovering for an operation. The decision to pretend everything's all good, the show's back on the road, here's the family smiling on a Sunday, that, to me, was their mistake, whether the image is real or not. It yeah, absolutely is. And you have to question why the palace or why uh, the Prince and Princess of Wales have got such a poor PR team behind them. Mm. Because anybody would have seen, if you're suggesting that Catherine is very unwell, she's not back on royal duties, why put the photograph out? Yeah. Why bother doing it? If she's not doing royal duties, you don't need to publish a photograph. It was Mother's Day. You could have put up a little message saying to all the mothers or those who uh, feel like they're a mother to a child, happy Mother's Day. Put a little mm. picture of a daffodil. Whatever it might be, you don't need to go to these lengths to put something out there, which we now have been talking about for the last couple of weeks. Now, I've got no evidence that Catherine did not pose for that photograph. Of course, the palace will be clear that she did pose for the photo and they just messed up with some of the editing and she said she's an amateur. What's your view? Do you think that image is kosher? I don't think it is. I really don't. The more you look at it, I mean, when I first saw it, I just thought, oh, what a lovely photograph. Mm. That was very nice. And then you start to notice the inconsistencies mm -hmm. and you think this is awful. Are these people actually in the same room at the same time? Because yeah. it doesn't feel like they are. But always, always, this is what happens, whether it's in politics, whether it's in showbiz, the cover-up is what gets you in the end. Yeah, most definitely. Look, folks, uh, what's your view? Let me know your thoughts on this. It's a massive story and it's not going anywhere. Mark at GB News. News.com. Now we've been conducting an exclusive Mark Dolan tonight People's Poll. Should the palace come clean about Princess Catherine's health? I will reveal the results next. Plus, in the big story, Wales are to have their first black first minister, but will Vaughan Gething undo the damage caused by Mark Drakeford? Plus, is Rishi Sunak 
about to be sensationally replaced as PM. I'll be asking a former member of the Senate and ex-Tory MP, Neil Hamilton. He's next. You're watching Mark Dolan tonight on GB News. Nana Queer. Weekends from 3 p.m. So after his mad dash to see his father last week, Prince Harry predictably went on TV to talk about it. He gave his first interview to Good Morning America, whilst apparently being filmed by a crew that were doing a documentary on the Invictus Games. He didn't disclose his father's diagnosis, but frankly, even the fact that he was on TV talking about it was concerning. No wonder they're keeping him at arm's length. This is what he said. How did you get the news that the King was ill? Um, I spoke to him. And what did you do next? I jumped on a plane and, and went to go see him as soon as I could. How was that visit for you emotionally? Um, look, I, 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 love, I love my family. The fact, that I was, the fact that I was able to get on a plane and go and see him and spend any time with him, I'm grateful for that. An illness in the family can have a galvanizing or sort of reunifying effect for a family. Absolutely. Is that possible in this case? Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, you know, I've, uh, throughout all these families, I see it on a, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, the, again, the, the strength of the, of the family unit coming together. Mm. He also said that he loves his family, but then he said that he had his own family in America. So which family does he love? The late Queen's last few years of life were marred with accusations of racism, which Harry later backtracked on, claiming that they hadn't actually used the word. So inadvertently admitting to gaslighting us all. But the Sussexes' stock is falling in the States, and the only thing that makes them interesting is their proximity to the royal family. And now the king is ill, Harry has even offered to muck in and take on official duties to help his father. Look, I want to see reconciliation and love and joy, but I'm afraid Meghan has yet to even speak to her father, as far as we know. And Harry didn't apparently even reach out to his brother. Whilst his dad might fall for it, I doubt William will be as soft. Good luck with that, Harry. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Well, I don't think Catherine posed for that photograph. Her health is the priority, but I think the palace have made a ridiculous mistake by putting out what proved to be a very flawed and uh, questionable image. Well, the results, are, I should say, the emails are coming in thick and fast. Uh, Kath says, Mark, I agree with you. Catherine did not pose for this photograph. I think she was pressured to release a photograph because she's poorly and to stop the gossip. But it's made things so much worse. Where are her advisers? I feel very sorry for her. Alan says, Mark, being 100% a royalist who served my country, who the hell cares? Start talking seriously about the state of today's politics. Chickens, ferrets, and a possible lame duck waiting to take over. Charlotte says, you're all like vultures around a carcass. Leave the poor woman alone. Alfie says, for goodness sake, give it a rest, Mark. You're not being clever, just nasty. I liked you up until now, but dot, dot, dot. There you go, I'm on the naughty step with Alfie and a few of you. So uh, keep those opinions coming. Uh, this show is the home of diverse opinions. Let me have yours, Mark, at gbnews.com. Now, today at Sheffield University, they had a debate. How do you solve a problem like GB News? I'll be tackling that issue. And those that would like to shut us down, in my take at 10, you won't want to miss it. But folks, we've been conducting a Mark Dolan tonight. People's poll, we've been asking, should the palace come clean about Princess Catherine's health? Well, 56% 50, of you say no, and 43% say yes. So there you go. A majority saying, leave the poor woman alone. 
It's time now for the big story, and Vaughan Gething has been announced as Wales's first minister after winning the Welsh Labour leadership contest. He's first first black man to occupy the post after beating Jeremy Miles, the education minister, winning 51.7% of the vote. And he's made history as the first black leader, not just in the UK, but the whole of Europe. Here's what he had to say earlier. Winning the next general election could fundamentally change what we are able to do, not to have to constantly manage with less year on year on year, not to constantly have to claim the extraordinarily difficult choices that you're making in reducing errors that you've never wanted to, but actually the opportunity to talk about a future where there's hope. Well, congratulations to him. It's a huge achievement. But will he do better than the outgoing First Minister, Mark Drakeford, who's received criticism for 20-mile-an-hour zones across Wales, environmental policies affecting Welsh farmers, and what some see as an excessive response to the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, to get reaction to this news, I'm delighted to welcome Neil Hamilton, former member of the Senate, with UKIP. Hi, Neil. Your reaction to this appointment? Is it good news for Wales? Good heavens, no, of course not. Uh, you know, nothing's going to change whatsoever. A born getting is an arrogant, fat cat, lefty lawyer who's a fully paid up member of the Labour tribe, and he inhabits a high place on the Mount Olympus of moral superiority from where he looks down on the ordinary peasants uh, who don't know what's best for them, whereas he does. You know, he was in charge of the health service in Wales during COVID. He wanted to go harder and longer and faster in the lockdowns than the UK government did. And he made all these rules restricting people in uh, whether they could go out of doors and so on, and yet was exposed in due course for having a lunch on a park bench with his own children, uh, showing a great uh, message to the rest of the country. And Wales is a basket case economy. You know, the 20 mile an hour zones are really a metaphor for the whole of the Welsh economy, really. Wales is in the slow lane. It's gone backwards relative to the rest of the United Kingdom since devolution in 1999 because they've always had a Labour government. You know, it's really just a paler version of North Korea without <laughs> Kim Jong-il's successes. Uh, well, Neil, if Labour are doing such a bad job in Wales, why do they keep being re-elected by the Welsh people? Well, when I was a member of the Senate, they got half the seats on a third of the seats because of the way the electoral system works. Mm. And they're propped up by their little helpers in Plaid Cymru, who are even worse than they are. I don't know why Wales is so wedded to this uh, miasma of failure, which has engulfed the country, and which is why I wanted to leave Wales. I've been brought up there as a young person. I could see no hope except by leaving. Uh, all that's happened since devolution is it's just built a wall around Wales behind which it's now imprisoned by the limitations of the socialist mentality. So this is a tragedy for Wales, and I just wish that the Welsh people would wake up to it. Well, of course, Welsh Labour would argue they've been delivering for Wales, whether it's health service, COVID pandemic or, and the economy, and they would argue that their popular support suggests they're doing the right thing. But, Neil, let's talk about the whole of the UK now. Uh, could Britain be on the verge of having yet another prime minister with speculation that senior Tory backbenchers are planning a coup against Rishi Sunak and installing Penny Mordaunt, leader of the House, as an emergency prime minister? Uh, your reaction to this story, do you think it's got legs? Well, I'm sure Penny Mordaunt's got better legs than this story. She's certainly got great hair and she knows how to carry a broadsword. But unfortunately, she's going to be decapitated at the end of the year in the general election, and she's going to lose her seat in Portsmouth North. So it'll be short and sweet if she does replace, replace uh, Rishi Sunak. Uh, do you think that uh, Rishi Sunak's days are numbered? Uh, the Tories face an existential crisis, don't they, uh, in, in November, likely, October or November, most likely. Uh, do you think, I mean, you know those Tory backbenchers, you've been one of them. Do you think they'll act? Will they remove Sunak, do you think? I think it's extremely unlikely. Uh, and I lived through the major years, 1992 to 97. Mm -hmm. It was quite clear from September 1992, when Britain was humiliatingly ejected from the exchange rate mechanism, and we fell off the opinion polls, uh, it, 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 uh, so cliff edge, a uh, fall, and uh, never recovered. What was going to happen in 1997? And um, when John Redwood stood against John Major in 1995, Major resigned the leadership, provoke a leadership election, 
his slogan was no change, no chance. And that's what it proved to be. And unless the Tories change, it's not just a question of personalities or hairstyles or, or general looks. It's a question of policy, introducing a policy of hope, credibility and optimism. That isn't going to happen because the people who currently run the Tory party in Parliament have been selected by a process that David Cameron introduced when he was Prime Minister back uh, in 2010 to centralise control of candidate selection in the central office so they're all clones of people like him. And he, he's in government again now. I mean, if there was ever an indication of the moral bankruptcy and political bankruptcy of the government, it is that they couldn't find anybody better to be Foreign Secretary, the man who destabilised Lib Libya and uh, uh, a great part of the Middle East in conjunction with the American president at the time and has contributed towards the catastrophe which is going on there now. The Tories have just lost the plot. They have to be whipped out in a massive rout, and they need to be uh, reconstructed along true Conservative lines. The trouble is, overwhelmingly, the Tories in Parliament are really Social Democrats and centrists. They're not really Tories. And until they can reconnect with their political roots, they're never going to make any progress. Uh, Neil, before you go, briefly, if you can, um, I've got something of a milestone tomorrow. It's the 17th of March, St. Patrick's Day. It's my birthday, and it's the big 5-0. Can you believe it? But I think you've celebrated a significant milestone yourself. I think on the 9th of March last week, you turned 75. So, first of all, happy birthday, happy 75th. What is your secret? You look about 40. Well, my secret is my wife, of course, who uh, <laughs> keeps me happy. Uh, and uh, keeps me well fed uh, and calms me down when I get too excited about things. Uh, so, so that's uh, meant that I've been able to maintain my vigour over all these years. Uh, well, so, uh, and uh, uh, so, you know, I can give you some private lessons if you like. Uh, brilliant stuff. Uh, Neil, look, you look splendid, and uh, I hope you had a great birthday. We'll catch up soon. My thanks uh, to the uh, current leader of UKIP, ex Tory MP and member of the Senate with UKIP. Neil Hamilton. Uh, listen, let me tell you, the Welsh Labour are very popular in Wales. The Tories haven't got a sniff. The Lib Dems haven't got a sniff. Mark Drakeford and this new First Minister seem to be doing something right. Uh, and of course, Labour will be confident of electoral success when the election happens, whether it's in October or November. Are you living in Wales? Are you happy with the performance of Welsh uh, Labour? Let me know your thoughts, Mark, at gbnews.com. But next up, have we lost the art of raising children properly? I'll be asking former Sun columnist and TV psychologist Dr. Pam Spur, who's written an anti-woke book, especially for children, which aims to teach them resilience and independence. Dr. Pam is not pulling her punches about the state of modern parenting. And she joins me next. Good evening. Welcome to your latest GB News weather from the Met Office. So it's been a cloudy and wet afternoon for many of us, all due to an area of low pressure that's been moving its way towards the UK through the rest of Saturday and will push its way north and eastwards overnight tonight and into the start of Sunday. This will bring some heavy rain and has already brought some heavy rain, particularly to parts of southern Scotland. We could even see some snow across the hills and overnight and into the early hours of Sunday, some further heavy rain pushes up from the southwest, affecting parts of England and Wales. Under all that cloud and rain, it'll be a very mild night. Temperatures not dropping much below 10 or 11 degrees. But further north, there will be some brighter spells and that will allow temperatures to drop into the low single figures. So a chilly start for Northern Ireland and parts of Scotland with some sunshine widespread across these regions in the morning. Through the, through the afternoon, though, that band of rain pushes its way eastward, so some sunshine developing for much of England and Wales later as well. There will be some showers bubbling up through the afternoon. They could be quite heavy in places, but another very mild day. Temperatures as high as 16 or 17 degrees across the south, and even for Scotland, we could see in the double figures. Monday, a band of rain situated across the UK pushes its way eastwards, leaving a drier day for most of us. Plenty of sunshine through the rest of the morning, but for Northern Ireland, turning much cloudier as we head into the afternoon with that heavy rain arriving. It does then remain unsettled through much of next week, with temperatures widely above average for the time of year, perhaps 16 or 17. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. 
Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 till 11 p.m., only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Well, a big reaction on email to my conversation with Neil Hamilton about the possibility that Rishi Sunak could be removed from number 10 to be replaced by Penny Mordaunt. Um, how about this, says uh, Kevin. Yeah, hi, Mark. Yes, Penny may prove to be a gold sovereign, albeit too late. Rishi out now. OK, there you go. Well, look, uh, oh, and by the way, just one final thought on the Catherine photograph debate. That was the topic of my Big opinion. I don't think Catherine posed for that image. That's my view. I make no apologies for saying that because I think that if the palace are sharing images which are fake, we need to know. Uh, but Jill's not happy. Many of you, I've got to say, are not happy that I'm pursuing this line of inquiry. Jill says, I'm disappointed and surprised that you thought fit to carry on with the photograph controversy. Just take a deep breath and let go. Give them some peace. Jill, thank you for that. I'm very uh, appreciative that you've... Um, You've uh, said it as you see it. Uh, lots more to come. But next up with the news this week that the NHS are to ban the prescribing of puberty blockers to children in England, is the woke tide turning? And are children finally receiving the protection they need and the innocent childhood that is surely in their best interest? Well, my next guest certainly hopes so. so uh, she is the best-selling author, psychologist and former columnist at The Sun newspaper, Dr Pam Spur, whose new book aims to teach children the importance of hard work and independence. The book is called Eva the Bear and the Magic Snowflake, and it's out now. Dr. Pam, welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. Hello, darling. So good to see you. So it's good to see you. We go back a couple of decades, which oh, is actually least. amazing because you look the same. I don't know what you... Have you, you been using Princess Kate's Photoshop or what? <laughs> All the time. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, listen, I want, to, I want to talk about how the world has changed since we last worked together. But um, I'm going to get to the story of the book in a moment. Why did you feel the need to write the book in the first place? Well, I started writing children's stories after the birth of my first granddaughter seven years ago. And all of the stories I've been writing have messages that what I guess people would say are old fashioned, but I think mm. are, are new fashion. We need them, mm. you know, about courage and facing challenges and your, your family and how important it is. And so Eva the Bear was the one that I finally got sold to a publisher. And it took a long time because everybody sees me as she writes self-help. She does self-help books. You know, she's not a children's author. So it was quite a struggle to finally uh, find someone. Also, <laughs> we, we know that there's an awful lot of political correctness within publishing now. You've got sensitivity Jeez. readers. Some would say that publishing is sort of riven with woke ideology. Yes. But um, so was the messaging of your book a problem in terms of selling it? Well, I don't know, because when you're turned down by a publisher, they usually don't say why. And the, the easy answer was, she, to my agent, mm. was she writes for adults, so it'd be very hard to place her in the children's market. Finally, I found a publisher who had a much more independent spirit. <laughs> and, of course, the magic snowflake. Is that a sort of ironic nod to woke people being a bit snowflakey? <laughs> You can say that. No, it's actually, there is a magic snowflake in right. the book okay. that helps Eva find her courage. Well, her yeah, life. well, let's talk about that then. This is a wonderful character and really nicely illustrated as well. Um, what are the key messages of the book? Well, the key message is 
listen to your parents because mm -hmm. Eva is a rambunctious little bear who goes mm -hmm. off on adventures and gets herself in a spot of bother and she regrets not listening to her parents. Mm -hmm. um, but she finds the courage, she digs deep, finds the self-reliance, all those qualities that we need to teach children. They don't need quiet spaces and safe spaces for mm. every emotion they have. Mm. They need to learn that they can do it and they can move forward. And that's what Eva the Bear does. And I think the book is aimed at children, from anything from what, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years of age? Well, certainly they're the ones who can read, start to read it themselves, mm. but it's also good. I had one review on Amazon who said mm. his five-year-old loved it. And right. it wasn't too scary for a five-year-old. Three or four-year-old even could be read to because Eva does get trapped in the, the snow. Yeah, so <laughs> what are your thoughts about some of the things that are being said to children in an academic setting these days? The children in primary school being asked, are you a boy or a girl today? Well, I'm appalled. And I wish with the new consultation that Gillian Keegan has put out mm. that we would get some concrete, you know, opinions that she's, she's been asking for people's opinions, that will agree with the fact that no child should be trans behind their parents' back. Mm. Children should not be taught gender ideology, but that's a big problem because the 2019 Relationship, Sex and Health Education Act has it in there that they need to learn about gender identity. It's going to be a huge fight to get that out of the schools because children don't need labels. They don't need to choose from 110 genders. Mm. They just are a boy or a girl and they have a unique personality. It does not have to be put in a little box that, oh, if he likes ballet, then he must be a little girl. Or if she likes toy soldiers, she must be a little boy. No, any child can play with whatever they want to. Uh, of course, many in the classroom and elsewhere would say that children need to understand about the changing world and that if you establish the idea that people identify by different genres, uh, genre, uh, uh, genders, that, that actually you're helping those children to be empathetic and to understand how the world is changing. Do you take that well, argument? I would challenge that and say you, it, empathy is important. Children need to learn empathy, mm. respect, all those good traits. They do not need to be fed an ideology that it is as factual as, say, Greek mythology is right. factual. Because they're being taught at school, in some cases, that a boy becomes a girl and now she's the girl. And you, you challenge that thesis, that principle. I absolutely challenge that. And I, mm. I'm afraid in children's publishing, as we were saying, like there's the, the highly talented author and poet, Rachel Rooney. Mm. And she's been kind of drummed out of it because she wrote a book about celebrate your body. Don't change your body, celebrate your body. So the good authors are getting sort of drummed out. I don't know what's going to happen to me, but, you know, we'll see. And then all these ones who believe in gender ideology, ideology mm. are getting, you know, tons of sales. OK, uh, celebrate your body. Well, uh, let me tell you that uh, I've been celebrating my body for years now. Um, Pam, stay with us because uh, I've got my top pundits with me tonight. Diana Moran, Sajila Kershey and uh, the wonderful Claire Pearsall. Claire, um, what do you think about this book? It's called Eva the Bear and the Magic Snowflake. Would you read it to your kids if they were small enough? I think I probably would. I think anything that looks at children and giving them independence and resilience has got to be a good thing. Um, you need to understand children will be sad at times, they will be angry, they will be upset, they will be happy, and that's absolutely fine. As long as you realise that, you can tell them it's absolutely fine, but equally it's fine to be bored or cross. You know, things that don't necessarily look positive on the outside can actually teach children an awful lot. I mean, I'm not the, the greatest parent in the world, but I think that my son has grown up to be independent and resilient um, and turning into a all well-rounded uh, teenager. But I think it is incredibly difficult when the messages that they're being given in schools are watered down and you mustn't do things and you must look at every side of an argument. I think you should encourage uh, some vibrant thinking, some debate, and have differing opinions and be allowed to do that and explore those subjects. Sajila, so, have we lost the art of parenting in this country? I think parenting has actually just changed. Um, I think we're too ready to give in to children's whims. 
um, because we think we're helping them. We live in a disposable culture where like, if something's broken, we'll get them something new. That wasn't my experience growing up. If you've got one thing, you know, if you've got a toy, you've got a doll, you broke it, you wouldn't get another one. But we're you know, constantly giving them things, and that means giving in to their whims as well. Like, um, you know, it, I think it's a strange phenomenon where children aren't happy with who they are. Even with all this, I think, you know, it doesn't matter what social background you're from, we spoil them in many different ways. And giving in to a child when they say, hey, I, I want to be, my niece is 13, at her school, they have children that identify as different animals and they, collectively they're called furries. I couldn't believe this. It's like, why is that indulged? That's ridiculous. So, yeah, I think this good book's a great idea. I think children should be independent. Yeah. They should be brought up to, to you know, challenge things and, and know that people think differently. Yeah, uh, the furries. They should be brushed out of the classroom. Um, Diana <laughs> Moran, can you compare how you were raised as a child to how children are being raised in 2024? Well, I'm smiling away as I'm listening to all this going on because I'm 84, but I've got sons in their 60s uh, and also grandchildren in their 30s, I have to quickly add. I loved reading books to them. They had masses of books. Um, th the more we could read, the better. And we learnt in that way. There wasn't all the complications that there seemed to be this day and age. And we had fun reading, or we had sadness, or we had adventure. And hopefully all of them have learnt from all of those experiences that they've read about. Uh, Pam, I'm going to give my viewers and listeners details of the book in just a second. But uh, is the woke tide turning? Are we going to go back to normal ever? Well, I think the word woke has been so diluted that almost now we don't even know what it means. I think definitely the tide is turning because with the, the puberty blocker decision this week from the NHS, that is good news. Yeah. With, the, with the school's consultation, we hope some good news will come from that. I think people are waking up that they want their children to just be safe and happy as a boy or a girl and not worry about all this other stuff. OK, well, of course, uh, many people would argue that children need to learn about the fact that there are trans people out there because society is changing. And of course, we know that trans people are some of the most uh, picked on and abused in our society. So it's all about opinions. What's yours? Mark at GBNews.com. I'm delighted to say that Eva the Bear and the Magic Snowflake by Dr. Pam Spur looks to be a brilliant read and an almost certain bestseller. It's out now. Perfect for any child of any age, really. Up until 9, 10, 11, read it to them, then they can read it for themselves. Or you could read it to the woke people in your life, many of whom are grown adults. My thanks to you, Dr. Pam Spur. Coming up, you won't want to miss this. It might take a 10. Sheffield University today hosted an event entitled How Do You Solve a Problem Like GB News? I'll be reacting shortly. But first, my Mark Meets guest is one of Britain's brightest comedy stars, the popular actress from The Inbetweeners, The IT Crowd, Four Weddings and Casualty. Belinda Stewart Wilson brings the lols next. GB News Breakfast. Every day from 6am. Absenteeism. And parents whose children miss a week or more of school face increased fines in a government drive to tackle absence. This is another one of those government policies which has done nothing to improve the education of our children. In fact, since this was originally introduced some 10 years ago, the educational standards for our children, the 11-year-olds who can't read when they go up to primary school, have got worse and worse and worse. So it's not working. So what do they do? They just increase the fine, like that may make it work. Most of the parents who get fined are taking their kids up so they can take them on a holiday before the holiday companies push the prices up. Mm. And frankly, as a parent, if I've got a £600 discount on my holiday versus a £60 fine, hmm. I'm going to go for the 60 You'll suffer fine. the fine. Yeah. yeah. Let's not forget the other huge absence that children had uh, recently uh, during COVID. Mm. Schools were closed for months and months on end. Online learning was really not making up for that. Yeah. So how could, you know, it's very difficult for the government to say it was fine for us to take your kids out of school for, for months, 
But if you take them off for a few days to go to Disneyland, then you are the worst parent ever and you should be... But also, be it's, it's, it's the pandemic that, that caused some of the problems with absenteeism now. Absolutely. Because the mental health issues that some of these children now have. And there are tens of thousands of children, they, they call them ghost children, that have simply disappeared from the school register. So it that would be nice. It's, it's really, really scary situation. Um, I'm not seeing that the government is, you know, taking great measures well, to Well, I think that. one of their Punishing. plans is to have a national register, hmm. which, 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 which would help with that. Which would definitely help. But I think it, it's, it's almost... It's, you can't, well, they can't deal with the real problem, so they're going after it's... actually perfectly you know, decent parents who are just taking the odd day off you know, for, to save money, frankly. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Coming up in my Take at 10, Sheffield University today hosted an event entitled How Do You Solve a Problem Like GB News? I'll be dealing with the sinister forces that would love to close us down in no uncertain terms at 10. You won't want to miss it. But first, Mark Meads. And tonight, one of the most versatile actresses on TV, the star of many sitcoms, including The IT Crowd and The Inbetweeners, as well as BBC drama hits like Ordinary Lies and the long-running medical soap drama Casualty, Belinda Stewart Wilson. Well, Belinda's latest project is on the big screen with the heist rom-com Licence to Love, a Ukrainian and British comedy, which will be out in Odeon Cinemas tomorrow. Uh, Belinda Stuart Wilson, welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, we'll get to the movie in just a moment. Um, you had an interesting childhood, daughter of a British Army officer. Family spent many years on the move before you settled in the UK. So how did your childhood shape the person that you are? Well, I went to a lot of different schools mm. um, in sort of quick succession. So probably learned to make friends quite easily, I think. That was probably the biggest bonus. And how about the acting? What, what, what gave you that bug? Um, I went to a boarding school when I was about seven and we did the New Girls play and I remember getting on stage, um, I think I was playing Hiawatha. Um, <laughs> Top and, cast. <laughs> thank you. And I said to myself, I feel at home, I feel at home here. And um, mm. when I grow up, I want to be an actress and I, I kind of just about pulled that off. Yeah, <laughs> I'm mean, going to boarding school at seven, uh, blessing or curse? Uh, yeah. Um, bit it's, of both? A uh, bit of both. Um, it's, it's, it, it, it's quite um, hard when you're that young, because you can't tie your own shoelaces and you get in trouble. I've got a lot for that. But um, you do, again, learn to make friends. You become very independent. Yeah. But, you know, you're taken away from your family and your pets if you've got them and your mates and stuff. So it's quite... It's... Is it because your, your family was still on the move and it was better for you to be at boarding school? Yes, probably. Let's, let's put it that way, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's say that. Um, listen, you've done so much television comedy, the satirical show Broken News, the IT crowd, of course, the Inbetweeners. Um, I think, actually, producer Greg's been busy watching Inbetweeners clips all afternoon, laughing his head off, but he <laughs> told me that most of it we can't broadcast. It's so rude. It's very naughty, mm. uh, which I love. Um, but we found, I think, a, a broadly acceptable clip. Take a listen. Sorry, didn't realise you had friends around. Hello, boys. Hi, Mrs McKenzie. Hello. All right. I see you're enjoying Will's new WII. It's called a Wii. It's pretty neat, isn't it? It's the only computer game I've ever been able to play. Would you like a game now, Mrs McKenzie? Oh, no, I'm not very good. Even Will can beat me. You must be terrible. Well, I'll give you some tips. With this one, the trick is to bounce around a lot. Is it? Oh, yeah, you really need to bounce up and down. Hmm, OK, maybe I'll give it a quick game. No, you definitely won't. Uh, hysterical <laughs> stuff. Uh, you you couldn't really make a lot of what was in that show now, could I you? I don't think it will get commissioned now, no. It's, oh. it's so racy. 
Yeah, I mean, is that is that a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, are we getting a little bit too sort of nervous about offending people, or do you think uh, it's right that things have changed? And well, I'm just glad it it had its time in the sun, mm. and the fact it's changed isn't really really up to me. No, well, that's it exactly. Well, it's an absolute comedy classic. And uh, uh, speaking of which, I mean, you've you've done uh, lots of these sorts of things. Um, for example, you had a small role in Four Weddings and a Funeral. When you were making that film, did you are you not? Do you know I've what? Been on your Wikipedia. Apparently, no. you were a wedding singer on that. No, do you know who does that? Is Nicola? She's an actress called Nicola Walker. Right. Nicola See, Walker. This, this, this tells me and that I think we to look like each other. Wikipedia <laughs> is uh, quite an unreliable source of information. <laughs> so we're going to strike that one uh, from, the, from the court. Um, but listen, what about then? Uh, you, you did do quite a long stint in Casualty. I did about 10 episodes, I yeah. think, or something. I'm yeah. fascinated by shows like that, how it works. A real production line. Yeah, they, it's a machine and it's, yeah. a, it, it's moving and you've got, to, you've got to keep up with it and it doesn't stop. Um, and it, yeah. it's fast, but it's also... They do pay a lot of attention to detail and I, I do think, um, you know, they care about it. It's not just, you know, bish, bash, bosh. No, definitely not, which is why it's been successful for so long. Um, what, what sort of parts excite you? What, what is the sort of character you're drawn to? I do love playing comedy mm. parts and uh, something with a bit of great... I, I like doing both. I love doing drama. I love doing comedy. And if, if you can combine the two... And I love doing things like rom-coms. I love all that stuff. I mean, ideally, I think I'd be in rom-coms back-to-back. Yeah. I mean, we were talking just before we came on air about when they started, because I thought maybe it was Woody Allen with things like Annie Hall, but you'd say it goes back well, further. Well, I would say, you know, Billy Wilder, you know, some like mm. It Hot, The Apartment, yeah. um, Seven Year Itch, Marilyn Monroe stuff, all of that, you know, yeah. oddball comedy stuff, which is... All, they're all romantic comedies, really. Yeah, and um, we just had the Oscars uh, just passed. Um, what is what is your overview of the Oscars? Does it still matter? What do you think of award ceremonies? I've sort of lost lost interest in award I think ceremonies. It's probably quite healthy, isn't it? Yeah. Um, what to have lost interest? Yeah, because it's <laughs> yeah. all very fake, isn't it? I, I I just don't feel very comfortable watching them anymore. I'm not. I, I think I used to when I was little. I used to sort of you know you stayed up late to watch the Oscars because it was in America and it all felt very exciting. Yeah. And you'd think one day that'll be me. Um, but frankly, I'm sort of it's not me, and that's okay. I think that's a healthy thing. I mm. found it a bit of a, a yawn fest this year. Uh, let's talk about the new movie. It's called License to Love. Here's the the poster. I think Greg's going to fire that one up. Um, all Ukrainian direction production team who left the country with nothing. What a story. Yeah, and the, the, the crew were extraordinary and they, a lot of them had lost their homes. They'd been bombed. They didn't have anyone. They were, they were such a cheerful, upbeat bunch of people. You yeah. didn't, I didn't hear any of them complain. They were very sort of matter-of-fact about it and very accepting of what was going on, but um, they were an extraordinary bunch. They're a really lovely, lovely group of people. With yeah. really good production on that film. Uh, so fun to do and it's out tomorrow. It is out tomorrow, yeah. I think, but it was really good fun, yeah. It was really, really how long did it, How long does it take to make a movie like that? Well, I, we were out there for a couple of weeks, yeah. and um, I think, I'm not sure how long it took around that, but, yeah, it, they, they, they got that probably shock more quickly than Casualty. Unbelievable. <laughs> uh, listen, such a treat to have you in the Thank you so much studio. for having me. We're watching you for years, and we'll be watching you. What's next for you? Have you got any plans? I um, am very, very busy with lots of things in the pipeline, yeah. That's good. Well, listen, so you should be. Uh, really, really uh, fantastic, uh, always. Especially in comedy, which, as we can all agree, the hardest thing to do, let me tell you. Belinda and I should know. Um, coming up in the 10 o'clock hour, tomorrow's paper's hot off the press and tonight's top pundits, plus Sheffield University today hosts an event entitled How Do You Solve a Problem Like GB News? I'll be reacting in no uncertain terms next. That is about five minutes away. Don't go anywhere. Warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Good evening. Welcome to your latest GB News weather from the Met Office. So it's been a cloudy and wet afternoon for many of us, all due to an area of low pressure that's been moving its way towards the UK through the rest of Saturday and will push its way north and eastwards overnight tonight and into the start of Sunday. This will bring some heavy rain and has already brought some heavy rain, particularly to parts of southern Scotland. We could even see some snow across the hills and overnight and into the early hours of Sunday, some further heavy rain pushes up from the southwest, affecting parts of England and Wales. 
Under all that cloud and rain, it'll be a very mild night. Temperatures not dropping much below 10 or 11 degrees. But further north, there will be some brighter spells and that will allow temperatures to drop into the low single figures. So a chilly start for Northern Ireland and parts of Scotland with some sunshine widespread across these regions in the morning. Through the, through the afternoon, though, that band of rain pushes its way eastward, so some sunshine developing for much of England and Wales later as well. There will be some showers bubbling up through the afternoon. They could be quite heavy in places, but another very mild day. Temperatures as high as 16 or 17 degrees across the south, and even for Scotland, we could see in the double figures. Monday, a band of rain situated across the UK pushes its way eastwards, leaving a drier day for most of us. Plenty of sunshine through the rest of the morning, but for Northern Ireland, turning much cloudier as we head into the afternoon with that heavy rain arriving. It does then remain unsettled through much of next week, with temperatures widely above average for the time of year, perhaps 16 or 17. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Want to be a winner? You've won £18,000. I'm slipping neck. I don't know what to say. Enter our massive spring giveaway with three big seasonal prizes to be won. There's £12,345 in tax-free cash to give your finances a spring boost. We'll also send you on a shopping spree with £500 worth of vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. You'll also get a garden gadget package. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, Text GB Win to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. It is 10 o'clock on television, on radio and online in the United Kingdom and across the world. This is Mark Dolan tonight. In my take a 10, Sheffield University today hosted an event entitled How Do You Solve a Problem Like GB News? I'll be dealing with the sinister voice forces that would love to close this place down. And I'll be dealing with in no uncertain terms in just a few minutes time. How do you solve a problem like GB News? I'll give you the answer. Plus, a developing story tonight as tomorrow's Sunday Times exclusively reveal that the Prince and Princess of Wales will reveal all. 
about Catherine's health issues straight after Easter. I'll get instant reaction from the Queen of Royal reporting, Kinsey Schofield, live from Hollywood, California. Plus, tomorrow's newspaper front pages and live reaction in the studio from tonight's top pundits. So, a packed show. Mark Dolan tonight is your perfect Saturday night in. Crack open a bottle of beer, maybe a Guinness. It's St. Patrick's Day tomorrow. Or fire up the kettle. Let's get to work. How do you solve a problem like GB News? I'll be answering that after the headlines from someone that has no problems whatsoever. Aaron Armstrong. Thank you, Mark. I admire your confidence. Uh, it is one minute past ten. Very good evening to you from the GB Newsroom. Uh, Sainsbury's has been unable to fulfil the vast majority of today's online deliveries because of technical issues. Contactless payments in store were also affected, leaving thousands of customers either unable to buy groceries or having to queue for cash machines. Sainsbury's says it was caused by an overnight uh, software update. Tesco experienced similar problems, but on a smaller scale. Uh, both chains have apologised to the customers and say the unrelated issues have now been resolved. The man elected as the new First Minister of Wales has described his victory as a page in the book of our nation's history. Vaughan Gething will become the first black leader of any European country. He won a narrow contest against his only rival, Jeremy Miles, to win the Welsh Labour leadership race, taking 51 percent of the vote. He's expected to be confirmed as First Minister on Wednesday uh, when a vote will play, take place in the Senate and he'll replace Mark Drakeford, who's held the post since 2018. It means no UK nation will be led by a white male for the first time since devolution began in the late 1990s. Today, we turn a page in the book of our nation's history. A history that we write together. Not just because I have the honour of becoming the first black leader in any European country, but because a generational dial has jumped too. Like Ken and Jane, devolution is not something that I have had to get used to or to adapt to or to apologise for. Devolution, Welsh solutions to Welsh problems and opportunities, is in my blood. Now, there were plenty of problems on the roads earlier. Drivers on the M25 have been dealing with major disruption as unprecedented closures caused significant delays. Motorists reported miles of tailbacks on the approach to the five-mile closure between junctions 10 and 11 in Surrey. It's the first time the M25 has been closed during the day since it opened in 1986 and it will remain shut until 6am on Monday morning for bridge repairs. Finally, to Rugby Union, Ireland have retained the Six Nations Championship after beating Scotland 17-13 in Dublin. Dan Sheehan scored a try to give Ireland a 7.6 lead at half-time. Uh, another try in the second half from Andrew Porter looked to have given Ireland some breathing space. Scotland did hit back through Hugh Jones to make it nervy at the end, but Ireland hung on to win back-to-back -back titles. There's the captain, Peter Omani, lifting the trophy It may well have been his last match for his country. And in the last few minutes, uh, France won an entertaining game in Paris, beating England 33-31 to finish second. You can sign up to GB News Alerts for the latest on our story. Scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's back to Mark. Thanks to my good friend Aaron Armstrong, who returns in an hour's time. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. It's a busy one. A developing story this evening as tomorrow's Sunday Times exclusively reveals that the Prince and Princess of Wales will reveal all about Catherine's health issues after Easter. That's right, they're going to come clean, folks. I'll get instant reaction from the Queen of Royal reporting, Kinsey Schofield, live from Hollywood, California. Plus, at tomorrow's newspaper front pages and live reaction in the studio from tonight's top pundits this evening. Former government advisor Claire Pearsall, the green goddess herself, broadcaster Diana Moran, and comedian and broadcaster Sajila Kershi. Plus, they'll be nominating their headline heroes and back page zeros. A packed hour to come. Mark Dolan tonight is your perfect Saturday night in. Those papers are coming, but first, my take at 10.
An event took place at the excellent University of Sheffield today, organised by a group called the Media Reform Coalition, a name so dystopian it would have George Orwell turning in his sleep. The event was simply entitled, How Do You Solve a Problem Like GB News? How do you solve a problem like GB News? There's a lot to unpick there. First of all, what does problem mean? Is it a problem to offer a different view on the big stories of the day and the issues facing this country? Is it a problem to do that differently, like here on Mark Dolan tonight, with a bit of opinion, some fiery debate and a splash of humour? Is that a problem? Is it a problem to debate immigration, which saw the best part of three quarters of a million people enter the country last year? Something that even the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, says is too much. Is it a problem to debate British history in a balanced light, rather than characterising it as something to be ashamed of? Is it a problem to have a channel which is unapologetically patriotic and considers our country's past to be complex and flawed, but ultimately glorious? Haven't we given the world the industrial revolution, free market economics, which have lifted billions of people out of poverty, and shown the world what democracy looks like with the mother of all parliaments? With the help of the Allies, didn't we defeat fascism in two world wars? And weren't we the first to end the evil crime of slavery at huge financial, military and human cost? Is it a problem to stress the importance of human biology when looking at how our society is structured and organised and without which actual women will lose their hard-won sex-based rights? Is it a problem to see both the challenges and, dare I say it, yes, the benefits of Brexit. Well, none of this sounds like a problem to me. So what is the problem? Well, it's talking shops like this group in Sheffield or an egregious advertising ban which seeks to starve this project of funding. Many powerful people and organisations, the elite, if you like, the establishment, cannot bear this place because we're widening the debate around a whole range of issues which they thought they had stitched up. But the North London-inspired liberal consensus is no more, as demonstrated by both the Brexit result in 2016 and Boris Johnson's victory in 2019, which he sadly squandered. And whilst I'm no cheerleader of his, Donald Trump will confound the establishment all over again when he likely re-enters the White House in November. The likes of this panel in Sheffield are threatened by the rise of GB News. Why would an innovative small new channel made up of talented and diverse journalists and broadcasters producing 24 hours of balanced daily political debate be such a threat? Well, because we tackle some of the orthodoxies that I've mentioned. We dare to reflect wider public opinion in our content and we aim to give you a voice. They don't like that. Let's look at the other word in this event's title, solve. How do you solve a problem like GB News? That word contains within it the implication that this channel should be dealt with in some way. Would that involve crushing over-regulations so as to make the channel more vanilla than haagen ice cream? Would solving the problem like GB News involve closing the place down? Well, of course, that's what many dream of. Why else do the champagne-swilling, chattering classes gloat at and even encourage the aforementioned ad boycott? Don't forget the moment our fabulous head of sales was heckled at an advertising industry event for working for the People's Channel, working for you. Take a listen to how she... A talented and highly effective young woman heckled by drunken blokes at an awards bash. Charming. Don't forget ex-Sky News star Adam Bolton calling for this place to be shut down on BBC Newsnight in a debate which, surprise, surprise, was not balanced. Not one person present speaking up for the channel. Fair play to the brilliant former boss of Sky News, however, John Riley, who said the ad boycott is wrong. He's absolutely right and it's an affront to democracy. How ironic, therefore, that this group should be called Media for Democracy when the tenor of their debate seems to be about shutting down debate. 
Before this place existed, with one or two notable exceptions, including my old mates at Talk Radio and latterly Talk TV, plus the Mail, the Telegraph and the Express, we've largely had one-note coverage from the other news outlets, whether it was the madness of COVID lockdowns, vaccine tyranny, Brexit, the culture wars, October the 7th, and so much more. These folks in Sheffield are discussing the idea that GB News is a problem. But they're the ones with the problem. Because GB News is not going anywhere. If you cancel the people's channel, you cancel the people. And that's not going to happen. Not on my watch. I just won't have it. How do you solve a problem like GB News? Let me know your thoughts, mark at gbnews.com. I'll get to your email shortly. But first, my top pundits tonight. Very excited to have political commentator and former government advisor Claire Pearsall. Uh, we also have the green goddess herself, model and broadcaster Diana Moran, and comedian, writer, and all round legend Sajila Kershi. Uh, folks, uh, it's taking me longer and longer to get across that studio because I'm showing my age. I'm 50 tomorrow, so, you know, oh, please, oh, happy birthday. please thank you very much. Happy birthday. I know happy I only birthday. look 49. Um, <laughs> folks, uh, listen, where do we start? Um, Sajila Kershi, how do you solve a problem like GB News? Hmm, OK, so interesting monologue. Uh, some bits I agree with. Uh, overall, do I think that they shouldn't have had this debate? I think they should. Why not? What is the problem with that? The home, the home of free speech can't really go bitching saying that they don't want other people to talk about them. Mm -hmm. um, I studied media studies at university and we used to debate and have, you know, things on, on the Murdoch papers, problems with the Murdoch papers, problems with, you know, the tabloids versus... So that's, that's right. Critique is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm. Um, is there a problem with GB News? I think criticism, I think, you, you know, GB News could actually be better. It was sold to me when I first started here with that uh, you have left, right and in between views mm -hmm. and we have the discussion uh, and that, that was great. That was, I, I, I loved the idea. But the reality is that if you watch your programming over the day, and I do love your show because you do show different bias, you're not scared of three strong women for a start, unlike other shows. But, um, you know, it, it has changed because when you see the programming the whole day, it's all the same. It's all the same. And it can be divisive, in my opinion. It can. Uh, there's, a, there's a hell of a lot of Islamophobia going on here, dressed up as other things, which you might want to address as a channel. Um, you know, we talk about the Muslim vote. I don't agree with that. But actually, you probably lose the Muslim viewership if, you know, don't address that. Um, racism is never really addressed properly here. I was watching the program today and um, it's just sort of brushed under the carpet. Oh, well, what about her? What about her? What about her? Mm. So there's, there, you know, of course, just like we Christians when I've been on the show before, the BBC and their bias, you have to accept GP News has got a right-wing bias. I'm not actually a fan of politicians becoming presenters. There's, I could go on and on and on, but I also want to say the benefits, which is like people like me to get to come on this the show, mm. um, on your show specifically, and get to say, well, I don't agree with that. I, I, you know, and I think it's important because I am a ardent lefty. I am a bit woke. All those things that people don't approve of on the right, but it's important to have that balance and I think you do give that. Uh, Claire Pearsall, the magic of GB News and hopefully this program is that Sajila can say that and, and by the way I'm sure there's lots in what she's had to say. By the way I'm more than happy that this debate happened in Sheffield. I certainly wouldn't want that debate not to happen. I'm just looking at the question how do you solve a problem with GB News and it tells me that there is an agenda to get rid of this place or at least clip its wings. It's the use of the word problem. Why is it a problem? Why is having a news channel that potentially broadcasts some views that you don't like, why is that a problem? If you're at a university, you should be there to expand your knowledge, you're there to learn, you're there to pick up you know, things that will help you throughout the rest of your life. So if you can't debate something that you don't particularly like, then I think that's a university failing students. When I was at school, I was always dragged into the debating society to take the uh, position that no one else wanted to do, which was always a really unpopular Which decision. you now do at GB News. Clearly. I, that was obviously <laughs> my, uh, my stomping ground uh, at school. But it was good in the fact that you had to learn that people weren't always going to like what you had to say. Mm. As long as you say it with authority and you've learned from it and you've researched something, then absolutely fine. Um, I think talking about banning a channel, 
just is narrow-minded and you quite often find that the biggest critics of the channel have never watched it or have watched tiny bits of it mm. of one day. And as you were saying, there are different programmes throughout the day and there, clearly there are different positions given, there are different voices on there, which I think is really good. But it is very, very difficult to, to keep a, a, a semblance of balance sometimes with the subjects when you have a lot of right-wing views. OK, I mean, look, let's straighten a few things out, Diana. First of all, um, Sheffield University did not participate in this discussion. Uh, it was simply that the venue at, Sussex, uh, at um, Sheffield University was used. Uh, the group are the Media Reform Coalition, um, and they're not saying they want to shut down GB News. They want to debate all the controversy that surrounds the channel. What's your view? My view is that having worked with the BBC, I was trained with the BBC all those years ago, um, and it's I admire the corporation, don't get me wrong, uh, but I just adore this channel, GB News, because it's so open. You can say what you feel. You're not going to... I'm not going to upset you. You're not going to upset me. And as long as I don't swear and all the rest of it, I feel that I can put my point of view across, which I think is wonderful. One criticism, and you didn't mention it, actually, I do watch GB News a lot. I really enjoy it. I, it, it taxes my brain very often, and that I like. But I do find that there is a bit too much repetition in yeah. one day I of agree. those same that subjects. That's exactly what I meant. Right. Yeah. Of That's exactly same, what I meant. Yeah. Uh, fascinating. Well, look, there you go. I, I'm all ears. Folks, what do you think? How do you solve a problem like GB News? Uh, what do you think the message is from this group who are called the Media Reform Coalition about what they think of this channel and what the establishment think of this place? Uh, let me know your thoughts because this place belongs to you. Mark at GBNews.com. But next up, a developing story tonight, as tomorrow's Sunday Times exclusively reveal that the Prince and Princess of Wales will reveal all about Catherine's health issues after Easter. I'll be getting instant reaction from the Queen of Royal reporting Kinsey Schofield, live from the US, next. Headliners. Tomorrow's papers tonight, every night from 11pm. Is a debate on gender really a far-right issue? Far right. I'm so bored of that phrase, you know what I mean? Like, anyone who talks about... Anyone who acknowledges that there are two sexes is suddenly far right, because that's what, that's what Hitler and Mussolini were all about. Um, this, this question from Shirley is, of course, about Labour. They've been accused of being undemocratic because they pressured a pub into cancelling a debate, and this debate features Kelly J. Keane, who's been on this show a couple of times, uh, and she's a campaigner, and she was just on the panel, and then they got a letter saying that they couldn't do it because Kelly J. Keane apparently attracts far-right groups. Now, they've tried this trick before, but because some awful, ghastly neo-Nazi types turned up near to an event that she was holding in Australia, they kind of tried to blame that on her and suggest that the two were the same thing. They weren't. That was an opportunistic group turning up to... They're not... Neo-Nazis aren't pro-feminist. They're, they're not pro an event called Let Women Speak. That's just ridiculous. <laughs> New Zealand's uh, TV uh, blurred her uh, touching her zip because they said that her touching her zip was a far-right uh, dog whistle because she's... she's She's making that symbol. Yeah, but when she, she wasn't making the symbol. Wow. She was just adjusting a zip. Yeah. And, and all, all also, this isn't a far-right symbol. I mean, that's, that was incredible because she obviously wasn't making that symbol anyway. She was just adjusting a top. But this New Zealand uh, news channel blurred out the hand so that they could <laughs> pretend that it was some horrible ghastly... Yeah. I mean, well, this well, is she's, she's, stuff, we, she's talked about having voted Labour in the past. She's yeah. so not far-right. But also, I mean... even if she were right-wing, which she yes. isn't, why would they be banning a panel where there's a discussion about... an? One of the most important issues of our day. What well, did Labour playing at here? They're anti-democratic, aren't they? They're just kind of playing whack-a-mole with things they don't like. I think yeah. maybe I'll write to the pub and say I do want to see Kelly J. Keane there. Yeah, but it's... they won't listen to you well, if no, you they say won't. that, will they? Because they? you've got the unfashionable opinion, Chris. Well, I'm the unfashionable workplace. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially 
yours. GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. How do you solve a problem like GB News that was debated at Sheffield University today? Well, the emails are coming in thick and fast. I'll get to them at 10.30 with the papers. But first, US News with the Queen of American Showbiz, Royal and Political Reporting, Kinsey Schofield. Kinsey, great to see you. What a week for the Royals. Um, tell me about this exclusive from the Sunday Times. Uh, the Waleses are going to spill the beans. Tell me more. Uh, that's what we're hearing. They absolutely just might. The Times on Sunday is reporting that the Prince and Princess of Wales could address the mystery surrounding Catherine's health at an upcoming public engagement after Easter. This is according to a close friend. They also say that the Prince and Princess of Wales plan to be clear and more open about the princess's recovery from abdominal surgery. Um, in the same piece, friends are concerned about the negative effects rumors circulating online could be having on the princess's recovery, adding additional stress that the palace has clearly you know, tried to avoid. Uh, most definitely. Uh, clearly, you know, there's a debate about whether we have a right to know about Catherine's health. What's your view? Because you're very supportive of the Princess of Wales. I mean, I've got viewers tonight saying they're very disappointed with me that I'm pursuing the photo story. I, you know, I, I am under the impression that she uh, deserves her privacy, but I also, coming from a PR background, understand that something more than a tweet needed to happen after that photo fail. Um, it mm. was a mistake. It was an honest, innocent, innocent mistake. We all Photoshop our images. Uh, you know, Mark, I, I, I just since I've been talking to you, I've taken away three of my chins. I'm actually <laughs> I'm very, a, a very unattractive person. But um, I, I think that it becomes a historical issue when you are a historical figure. This mm. is the this is the queen going to be the queen one day, and like you, I, why not just auction off the original photo to a great cause, make it a bigger story, make it a happy ending, and make light of the subject. And in doing so, you're releasing a photo without truly without it being pressure from the media or the public, and you're elevating a great cause that means a lot to you, and you nip the whole thing in the bud. But what we're seeing is the prince and princess of Wales being, uh, you know, I, I hate to use the word stubborn, but they're in a position to be stubborn because they are the most popular royals without a doubt. Uh, well, absolutely. I mean, look, my viewers are furious, a lot of them anyway. Trish says, Mark, you're absolutely disgraceful the way you've been harping on about the Mother's Day photo. Uh, it is a story which is dividing opinion. Uh, do you think Meghan is enjoying Princess Catherine's first ever PR disaster? I would hope that she wouldn't be enjoying it, but, you know... Um... She's certainly taking advantage of it from a marketing perspective. Even CNN here in the state, which has been notoriously critical of the monarchy, uh, cited Meghan's launch being suspicious and ill-timed, mm. while noting that Catherine is about three times more popular than Meghan. Uh, so I don't know if she's relishing in it, but I, I do know that it's clear she's taken advantage of it. Of course, uh, Meghan is entitled to launch her brand whenever she likes, and the Sussexes would uh, challenge the idea that the timing was coincidental. Um, why are Instagram picking on Catherine, Kinsey? This is the wildest thing I've ever seen. I have never, I am a Instagram junkie, and never in my life have I seen a disclaimer saying that a photo has been edited. A photo uh, is, is not the original photo. And we're mm. seeing that now on the Prince and Princess of Wales's image. This is wild to me, Mark, because Instagram is a, a, a place where there are entire profiles dedicated to AI women that do not exist in real life. They monetize their whole platform and, and they're just computers. Like it's just a picture of somebody that you cannot see at Walmart. 
Uh, and also, like, think about the Kardashians. I've never seen their real face on there, and I can say that confidently. So I, it does feel like Instagram is picking on the Princess of Wales mm -hmm. here. I've personally reached out to them and said, who made this decision and why? Of course, I'm not big enough for anyone to respond. Uh, but I do think that there, this is a, you know, kind of bullying in a way. Well, and I think I tend to agree with you. Um, let's talk about Tucker Carlson, who is uh, probably the most famous news broadcaster in America, if not the world. He recently interviewed Vladimir Putin in the Kremlin. How has he got tied up in this uh, Photogate scandal? It just gives you kind of an idea of how crazy this story has become, not only where you are, but here in the States. Tucker Carlson and his team received some outreach from an individual claiming to be the person that actually photoshopped the Princess of Wales's image. They said they wanted to take the heat off of Catherine, so they wanted to give Tucker an exclusive interview. Oh, my goodness, Mark. They fell for it. <laughs> uh, his name is, it's a YouTube prankster named Joshua Peters. And while Tucker's team did say, can you send us proof that you worked with the Waleses? All they did was get on Photoshop and, and make up some fake paperwork that actually was ludicrous if you read the fine print. Um, Tucker went through the, through with the entire interview, and thankfully somebody on his team recognized this guy, so the interview never aired. Uh, but it just goes to show that this is a story globally that everyone is so obsessed with that mistakes like this are being made. Uh, Kinsey, I wish we had longer. We'll catch up next week. My thanks to the Queen of US Showbiz Royal and Political Reporting, Kinsey Schofield. Check out her brilliant website, todieforedaily.com, and her podcast of the same name. Next up, tomorrow's newspaper front pages with full pundit reaction. Lots to get through. See you in two. Good evening. Welcome to your latest GB News weather from the Met Office. So it's been a cloudy and wet afternoon for many of us, all due to an area of low pressure that's been moving its way towards the UK through the rest of Saturday and will push its way north and eastwards overnight tonight and into the start of Sunday. This will bring some heavy rain and has already brought some heavy rain, particularly to parts of southern Scotland. We could even see some snow across the hills and overnight and into the early hours of Sunday, some further heavy rain pushes up from the southwest, affecting parts of England and Wales. Under all that cloud and rain, it'll be a very mild night. Temperatures not dropping much below 10 or 11 degrees. But further north, there will be some brighter spells and that will allow temperatures to drop into the low single figures. So a chilly start for Northern Ireland and parts of Scotland with some sunshine widespread across these regions in the morning. Through the, through the afternoon, though, that band of rain pushes its way eastward, so some sunshine developing for much of England and Wales later as well. There will be some showers bubbling up through the afternoon. They could be quite heavy in places, but another very mild day. Temperatures as high as 16 or 17 degrees across the south, and even for Scotland, we could see in the double figures. Monday, a band of rain situated across the UK pushes its way eastwards, leaving a drier day for most of us. Plenty of sunshine through the rest of the morning, but for Northern Ireland, turning much cloudier as we head into the afternoon with that heavy rain arriving. It does then remain unsettled through much of next week, with temperatures widely above average for the time of year, perhaps 16 or 17. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel.
Welcome back. Small team today, Greg, Ben and Alistair. Thank you for your hard work. It's time now for the papers. And we start with the Sunday Mirror. Uh, Geo breaks silence after row. I'm gutted that Amanda left. I thought we'd win, Strictly Pro says he's just a perfectionist. Of course, this was Amanda Abingdon, who's an actress, who quit strictly during rehearsals before they'd been eliminated from the show, but her dance partner says he thinks they could have won. The Mail on Sunday now, the ultimate guide to avoiding ultra-processed food with Dr. Michael Mosley. Well, I don't recommend much on this show, but can I just recommend Dr. Michael, mostly, <laughs> ah, because uh, yes. he's a doctor and uh, I read his book, the, uh, the Keto 800, Fast Keto okay. 800, mm -hmm. lost a load of weight, felt brilliant. Um, he's great and uh, he's got a seven page health special in the mail on Sunday. Um, obviously, if you're going to change your diet, do consult your doctor. Also, Princess's friends condemn cruel exploitation as Paris tragedy photo promotes assisted dying. The headline, Diana Crash used in vile euthanasia ad campaign. This is Diana, Princess Diana's crash used to sell the idea that you can take your own life. Also an exclusive yeah. in the Mail on Sunday. A devastating poll, Tories are heading for biggest defeat ever. The Tories are heading for the worst defeat in the party's history, according to bombshell private polling seen by the Mail on Sunday. A Russian missile threat to Shaps on Ukraine visit. Kate plans to be open with the public on health. Uh, that is an exclusive from my pal Roya Nicker, who is their royal editor, and it's quite the scoop. Uh, a first for Wales and Europe, the first uh, black first minister of Wales, first black leader in Europe, full stop. Um, intensive care ceiling collapses and hedge fund played for Boris Johnson's trip. Sunday Express now. Uh, Farage... Plots Sunak's demise. Nigel Farage, GB News star, is set for a dramatic return to frontline politics in a move that could spell catastrophe for the Tories. The Brexit champion is being lined up to lead Reform UK's election charge and is said to be on a mission to finish off the Conservatives once and for all. OK, where should we go next? Oh, we've got the Telegraph. Well done, folks. Uh, Mordant is stalking horse for right-wing Tory rival. Uh, this, of course, is speculation about whether Rishi Sunak could be replaced. I'll get more on that shortly. Uh, observer now. Tories slam bonkers plot to topple Sunak as chaos mounts. And meta-expert Instagram is fueling a rise in suicides. Ooh. Last but not least, a much-needed smile from the Daily Star Sunday. Men who wear old-school undercrackers <laughs> make the best lovers, apparently. <laughs> oh, who's a cheeky boy, the then? Today. <laughs> why, oh, why, oh, why fronts? Yes, indeed, blokes who wear old-fashioned why fronts are the hottest in bed. It's undeniable, because a poll of Britain's women assure us that it is true. Well, <laughs> you'll be relieved to hear I'm not wearing anything tonight. Uh, oh. TMI, they call that too much information. Of course I am. I'm, I'm wearing Marks and Spencer's briefs because I am patriotic. Marks and Spencer's <laughs> is a great <laughs> British brand. And yes, they're fresh. I had to in case um, I go in an ambulance. My mother would be horrified if I didn't. <laughs> Let's get a reaction to the front pages from tonight's uh, top pundits. By the way, can I just say that I'm wearing M&S, but tomorrow I'll be wearing Next, the day after. <laughs> Yeah. Primark. Other supermarkets are available. Uh, reacting to tomorrow's front pages, I've got political commentator and former advisor to the government, Claire Pearsall, model journalist and the green goddess herself, Diana Moran, and the brilliant broadcaster, comedian and actor, Sajila Kershey. Uh, lots of stories to get through. Um, let's have a look at this one. I mean, who could take their eyes off that headline, Claire? Nigel Farage plots Sunak's demise. Uh, the mood music is that... Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, appears to be in fatal trouble. Well, it's not a surprise. I think he's been in trouble pretty much since he took over. There wasn't much of a honeymoon period mm. when he came in after Liz Truss's 45-day um, experiment. Mm. And he's not really made anybody come along with him on the journey of... I'm not sure what it was he actually wanted, some kind of integrity and professionalism and it was all going to be wonderful. Well, the policies need to be there and unfortunately that hasn't happened. And he lacks a little bit of the sort of political 
nous that you need when you're in number 10. I think that we really have to question how good he is at politics with the mistakes that are constantly being made. Mm. Somebody like Nigel Farage will be a massive um, problem to the Conservative mm. Party. He is incredibly popular. He's very clever at what he does. Whether he really wants to go back in and be the face of reform remains to be seen. I think at the moment he is doing a pretty good job of that from outside of the party. Well, yes, I mean, are the Express guilty of overselling this yeah. story by suggesting that Farage plots Sunak's demise? I mean, that would only be decisive if perhaps he became the leader of Reform UK. That's right, and you have to question whether he wants to do that, what mm. really is in that for him, because it, he's incredibly successful looking from the outside. He works well in America. He's very close with Donald Trump. So his ability and his skills lay outside of one particular political party. And I don't see what the benefit is to him. I'll come to the others in a moment, but you are a former government advisor. And I just want to ask you, I mean, yes, Sunak hasn't really had much of a honeymoon period. You know, it'll make approximately two years by the time of the next election. But um, is there an hour ahead of steam to get rid of him? That's the question. <clears throat> I mean, this rumour goes round pretty much on a weekly basis. Mm. Um, I don't buy it, and people that I've spoken to in Westminster just say it would be absolutely catastrophic. But it's catastrophic already, so what would they have to lose? Diana Moran, do you think the Tories should bite the bullet? It's kitchen sink time, isn't it? It certainly is. I mean, I, I, I'm not a political animal, really, but, I mean, you can't get away from the fact that they are trying to get rid of him mm. at the moment mm. um, by fair means or foul. And I have to admit that Farage is such a strong character um, that he could probably, um, in, in a certain party, he could probably turn people like myself from one party to another. Right, well, that's really interesting. I mean, the dilemma facing Nigel Farage, Diane, is, Diana, is, is whether or not he stays with Reform UK, or does he wait for the Tories to implode and then rescue the oldest party in the history of European democracy? Oh, my goodness, I hadn't really thought that he'd do that. He hasn't ruled it out. Let's watch this space. Because that's... that's a, I'm going to come to this, Sir Gila, in a second, but that is, that is possible, that Nigel hasn't completely given up the idea of going back to the Tories after the election when they've had an existential defeat hey. and mm. rescuing the whole project. OK, but to do that, you'd have to become an MP in the first place. Mm. So you have to be elected mm. to a seat. So it's not quite as simple as just striding in saying, I shall take over. Mm. I mean, yes, he, he has the ability to do it, whether he wants to go in and be a backbench opposition MP, which is really hard work. I've, I've mm. been in opposition prior to 2010, and it's really difficult. Uh, Sajida, so are we about to have a new Prime Minister? Do you know what? What a great time if you're a Tory, like if you if you're one of the MPs, isn't it fantastic? Because everybody can have a go at being PM. <laughs> Take I mean, turns. everyone. I mean, you know, you can have it on your CV. So I mean, <laughs> it was, it was going to be a few months, maybe November. I'm the, October. When are we going to have the yeah. election? Oh, you know, by the way, it's, it's later in more. May. It's later in May still possible. Yeah, no. of course it is. Right. You could also move the date of the local elections. So just because Rishi Sunak rules out an election on the second of May. Mm. The nominations for local elections haven't closed until the beginning of April. Uh, so, Sajila, how about that story in, and let me get it, because it's uh, quite shocking for the Prime Minister, whether he survives or not. Um, and this is in the Mail on Sunday, uh, an exclusive, Sajila, devastating poll. Tories are heading for the biggest defeat in history. OK, that's the one... Oh, the Mail on Sunday. Um, devastating poll, Tories are heading for the biggest defeat ever. Oh, quel surprise! <laughs> oh, well, that's a shock, shock horror. Fame, fame, fame's her fainting. Um, no, I think um, we know it's that they're not going to. They're, they're done, right? We know that, and they know it. But they're kind of trying to make so much mess before they leave. Mm. You know, like when when you, when you're a student and you leave your digs and you, you crush biscuits in there because the landlord's you know been a bit of a git. Um, and that's what they're kind you're of. You're revealing thinking. a lot with these anecdotes, yeah. <laughs> Sajila. Yeah. Well, that's what they're doing. But I do think Liberal Dems, which where are they right now? I mean, I've not heard from the Lib Dems. They could take this now because. Both the main parties, two parties, I think they're... Well, I don't know what they stand for, so I'd like to know. Well, I mean, and I'm... I think that's largely the problem, is that, yes, this should be prime territory for Liberal Democrats to Where are they? They're, they're, unfortunately, they, their policies are so bizarre. They don't really know what they stand for, and they don't have a strong enough leader. So they're not coming through. 
The local elections normally where they do well, and I think that we're going to see independents or other parties mm. coming through doing much better than they are. Of course, you know, Labour will argue the Tories have made a horlicks of the last 14 years, and uh, frankly, it's time for change. The SNP would argue that they're very popular in Scotland and delivering for the Scottish people. Um, listen, it's all about opinions. Um, can I get your opinion on this one, Sajila? Uh, an exclusive in the Sunday Times, a great scoop from somebody I've worked with in the past, uh, who is uh, Roya Nicker, their royal editor. Um, Princess Kate, Catherine, plans to be open with the public on her health. She's expected to speak about her recovery from surgery as she resumes public duties next month. Sources close to Catherine, who has requested privacy since undergoing an abdominal operation in January, believe that she'll be clear and open about her health when she has fully recovered and may talk about it during an engagement. Do we have a right to know about the okay, Princess of Wales's health? They're sending out really mixed messages. So you send out a photo, which you didn't need to do, but you mm. sent out the photo. And now it's saying, look, you, you all will be relieved. All will be relieved. All will be revealed. <laughs> all will be revealed after Easter. Why after Easter? It's like, it's like um, who shot JR yeah. all over again. Do you know what I mean? It's like, why do we have to wait till end, after end Easter? End of season cliffhanger. Yeah, it's but a season cliffhanger. But they've always said until after April. This isn't new. True. She wasn't going to appear at all until after April. But don't send out the photo. So, uh, well, that's different. We're talking about her actually appearing. But you see, the problem with that photograph is it then established the debate about how she's doing. And that's why I said, in my big opinion, they shouldn't have released the photo no, in the first place, right. whether it's real or not. Mm. Um, if she's going to have privacy, then privacy she should have. And it was the palace who effectively brought this on themselves, Diana. It was an error of judgment on their part, a very, very big error. Mm. Um, uh, Diana, do we have a right to know about the health of royals? The health of... Royals, generally, royal, royal, royal members of the family. Uh, the, no, I don't think any more than w that you have the right to know about our health. Yes. If something goes wrong, I had major problems when I was 47, and in the public... I was in the public eye, but I didn't want the public to know about it. Yeah. So I disappeared for quite a long time to deal with my problem, and that's how I think many of us would want to do... I didn't want to give the press my uh, what was going on, and therefore I don't think we should know too much about Catherine. I, I, I agree with you to, to a large extent, but when it comes to the royals, they are the head of state. So I do think we do have a right to know if our future king is ill, if our future queen, if there's something serious. But also on the flip side of that, is if we if you tell us, which of course I know she's telling us after Easter. It can help other people in a similar oh, situation, yes, you know. But I do, I do, I don't sort of think this thing like you've got. Yes, you can have a bit of privacy, but at the end of the day, you are the head of our, you know, country. So we do have some right to know if you're in a dangerous. But because he's got cancer, we don't know what kind of cancer. You know, um, we we don't know what Kate had. We but okay, they're going to tell us in in, in April. Mm. But I think that'd be helpful. Whatever she's got to help other people in a similar but situation. The problem that the King did have the prostate cancer, mm. uh, the prostate, sorry. Procedure. Uh, yeah. Procedure he was open about, and people have um, benefited from that. They've gone to see their doctors, and their people are talking mm. more openly about it. Mm. That he's now gone quiet on the next bit, I'm quite happy about. Well, indeed, I mean, here's the question, Claire. Did the King open a can of worms by revealing his health status in such detail, and is that the problem that Catherine now faces, because the royals are oversharing? I don't think it's oversharing. I think the king actually made the right decision, and it does help people. If, mm -hmm. if somebody in the public eye has that conversation and it encourages people to go and get their health checked and to be able to talk about those kind of issues, then fantastic. Mm -hmm. But it was his choice to do it. Unfortunately, with this one, and I do think you're right, Sajila, that we've had... You can't have it both ways. The mm. palace has said that uh, the Princess of Wales is ill and we're not going to talk about it and you mustn't talk about it and we'll blanket ignore you. Yeah. And now they're saying, oh, but we are going to release the information. She's going to come clean and a tell-all, you know... And here's a dodgy, here's a dodgy photo of her on Mother's Day so with her one-footed son, that? George. <laughs> do you have any idea what, when he lost the foot, George? Because <laughs> Prince George in his photograph only does only have one foot. <laughs> and then the, the other little lad has Louis, got a twisted uh, finger, Louis, which, Louis. Which, which means his piano-playing days are behind him. Well, yeah. arthritis. We're discussing arthritis now. Junior arthritis. Yes. Which I suffer from, so I can 
Yeah, enough. Absolute. <laughs> enough is enough. E enough is enough, and I think yeah. lots of viewers feel the same way. I've got to say, um, a quick bit of showbiz. Uh, I'm gutted Amanda left. I thought we'd win. Now, look, I don't watch Strictly, uh, but this is a big show on the BBC. Amanda Abingdon is an actress, <laughs> Diana Moran, yes. who left the show because... Well, she was unwell and I think rather stressed by the experience, but her dance partner has said she shouldn't have left, we would have won. Well, yes. Have you done Strictly? Uh, I, I haven't, no. Oh, no, no you'd, you'd be, be amazing. a perfect yeah, candidate yeah, for that yeah, show. No, no, no. What, what about you'd you and amazing. Robin, your friend, that, you, <laughs> yes. that comes with you? Uh, but but uh, listen, it is um, an interesting one, isn't it? These reality shows are very demanding. Aren't they just? And, and twists and turns of people's characters come out yeah. under the stress and strains of these things. Very interesting. Yeah, Sajila. Have you done celebrity dance? I, I did. Let's dance for lovely. comic relief. Yes. You did. And I wore uh, gold lame hot pants, and, uh, and I've got to say, I've got a decent pair of legs. <laughs> yeah, I've got, got some good legs. legs. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I do. But I found it very stressful, and I was practicing the dance moves day and night, and I effectively, unintentionally, I recreated that scene from the Full Monty because I was queuing in a supermarket, <laughs> oh, no. and oh, I was no. doing the moves. Whilst oh, I was in the line, brilliant. and I realised when, when I'd done that, when you watch that film where the guy's practising, yeah, I think, yeah, at the yeah. post office yeah, or somewhere, wonderful. and it's because you're so afraid of forgetting the dance moves. Uh, but anyway, she's left that show. I wish her well. She's a nice lady, and uh, uh, there you go. What could have been, as they say, well, what will be is the final part of Mark Dolan tonight. Coming up, supermarkets, total chaos. What happened at Sainsbury's today? Their online deliveries stopped. Branches in chaos. Tesco affected also. We'll debate that, plus more front pages. See you in two. Dubes & Co. Weekdays from 6pm. Get this right. We all know by now, don't we, that so many uh, NHS workers are abused by people that they're trying to help. We'll all agree that that is pretty damn disgraceful, but what do we do about it? Because now uh, some London hospitals are looking at whether or not they should be able to ban people that do this for a year from those hospital facilities. Is that the way forward? Daniel, do you like this? No abuse, no excuse. That is the campaign. There's no other choice for most people. It's either the NHS or nothing. And if you're going to take that monopolistic power, then, then you need, I think, you have responsibilities towards people. You can't cut them off. So there are ways in which, of course, oh. you can bring criminal charges against them. Uh, if they've committed a criminal offence, that's fine. They might even be locked up in jail. But what you can't do is cut off health services because you're the only supplier. Well, yes, Peter? I think you can cut it off and you should cut it off. London is very different from everywhere else, and it goes back to our conversation about immigration. The majority of nurses in London are either African or Filipino, and it harks back to their nature and their culture. When you're younger, your parents look after you. When you're older, you look after them. They don't go into homes. So there's a way that a threshold of tolerance they have that is above and beyond most people. So, because I found, like, when I was younger, most of the nurses were white. Now they work in hospitals in Ascot and Somerset. London is the war zone. I have seen horrific things happen to nurses, and they stay, they show up for work. There's a protection they are owed, beyond owed. And if you abuse, if you abuse something that's offered to you as a part of your citizenship, you should be, there should be a penalty for that. Oh, for the same you. reason, if You're you commit... You're obliged to use if you commit, There's no offer involved in and, the NHS. But it is... No, but there is an offer, because at there the end of the day, like, you, earn it, you figure out how to get money and go private. So just because you've created something right, that so gives that's you the no, solution. no, it's easy. If you it's see, that's easy, an impossible solution. They've created something people. that's kind and easy and beneficial to all, indeed. But it's a good thing for all. Do not abuse it. That simple. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, 
GB News is Britain's election channel. But I don't like. Oh, uh, well, look, a big reaction on email to my take at 10. A group in Sheffield at the university, not the university itself, but the university hosted a debate about GB News. How do you solve a problem like GB News? Well, the emails are coming in thick and fast. Andy and Jan, hi guys. They've said, uh, Mark, I absolutely love GB News. I have it on the radio, in the kitchen, and YouTube in the office. And believe it or not, I sometimes even tune into Freeview 236. Now, yes, indeed, I can't get enough of GB News. I was a BBC Radio 4 listener for years, then I found GB. It was like waking up. It's obvious why the establishment want you to shut down. Shame on them. Keep it up, GB News. You're providing a service that no one else does. Andy and Jan, thank you for that. Uh, Norrie says, the thrills are alive with a GB News fix. Thank you for that, <laughs> very uh, creatively put. <laughs> and last but not least, Ernest says, Mark, the furore about Kate's photo is beyond belief and out of all proportion. You should know, we all know you're completely bald, yet you choose to wear that ludicrous wig, which makes Michael Fabricant look like Zac Efron. Ernest, thank you for your email, let me tell you. It's all mine. OK, uh, <laughs> listen, uh, let's get my pundit's uh, reaction to Meltdown at Sainsbury's, who have had to cancel most of their online deliveries today. The branches have been chaos as well. Tesco affected to a lesser extent. My local Sainsbury's was carnage today, with a queue going out the door. Claire, have you had a similar experience? Yes, there's two branches very near to me and their chip and pin systems went down. And obviously yeah. people were going out then to get cash out of the cash machine, which ran That's out it. of cash. So there were abandoned trolleys and you know, crying children all over Crazy. the place. Crazy. Uh, it's, 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 I mean, just goes to show you how reliant we are on these supermarkets, mm. Sajila. Um, all, almost all of Sainsbury's online grocery deliveries were cancelled. It's terrible. Can you think of all of the parties, the events mm. that didn't happen because of that? Oh, Sainsbury's, Sainsbury's, Sainsbury's. Come on. <laughs> I tell and you. you were out of blueberries. Uh, by the yesterday. way, here, here's one point. <laughs> Uh, it proves the importance of cash, doesn't it, when these systems yeah, go down, it does. Yeah. Diana? It just, yes. Yeah. Keep that cash in your pocket. You never know when you're going to need it. Keep it for a rainy day. OK, folks, well, let's get to your headline heroes and back page zeros. And uh, let's start with the zeros, please. Uh, Claire, who's your back page zero, your loser of the day? Oh, this is uh, Jonathan Wade, who is the National Highways project manager responsible for the current closure of the M25. Mm. Oh. And that in itself is a problem. But also his comments were really quite uh, blasé and told people to go and play in the garden or perhaps go and decorate their bathroom this weekend. Oh. Don't do that. Just be apologetic. Correct. Tell everyone it's going to be better and move on. Don't try and tell me how to live my life. Most definitely. Brilliantly put. Diana, your back page zero. My zero is Cheltenham Festival, mm. <laughs> of which I've been many, many times, changing Ladies' Day to Style Day. And why have they done that? Gender neutral green rebrand. I think that's disgusting. I'm sure all of us ladies here, there are occasions when we like to be ladies, put Absolutely. the hat on and all the rest of it, and be fated by you chaps. Well, definitely. Well, it's ladies' night tonight yeah. or Mark Dolan's <laughs> night. Don't worry, it's not Style Saturday. <laughs> not on my watch, Sajila. I just won't have it. <laughs> um, right, Sajila, your back page zero. OK, so my back page zero is Frank Hester. The Conservative Party have lost any credence in my eyes by defending um, this racist, misogynistic who thinks it's acceptable to incite violence um, against a black woman just because he's bankrolling the Tories. That's not acceptable in my book. Um, just to remind you, he said, Diane Abbott uh, makes you want to hate all black women, not just one woman, all black women. She should be shot. Um, and given oh, in the horrible. week that we've also been discussing extremism, what that is, okay. it, it just makes me so angry. Horrible, horrible, appalling remarks. Uh, only a few seconds left, so pretty much the name and a reason for your headline hero, Claire. It is uh, Gallopin Deschamps, who has uh, won the Gold Cup at the Cheltenham Festival for the second second time and it was an amazing race and he held on right Happy to the days. end of the nose over. Uh, briefly, Lenny Henry. Lenny Henry, epic, 37 years hosting Red Nose Day, raising over one and a half billion pounds for comic relief. And Sajila. And the Question Time audience on Thursday in Liverpool. Liverpool, you did us proud. Big, loud, angry slap from the good people of Liverpool against um, um, uh, Fiona Bruce Arsenal 
against a bad okay. extremism. Well, look, thanks to my pundits. Headliners is next tomorrow. Will Rishi survive? See you at nine. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Good evening. Welcome to your latest GB News weather from the Met Office. So it's been a cloudy and wet afternoon for many of us, all due to an area of low pressure that's been moving its way towards the UK through the rest of Saturday and will push its way north and eastwards overnight tonight and into the start of Sunday. This will bring some heavy rain and has already brought some heavy rain, particularly to parts of southern Scotland. We could even see some snow across the hills and overnight and into the early hours of Sunday, some further heavy rain pushes up from the southwest, affecting parts of England and Wales. Under all that cloud and rain, it'll be a very mild night. Temperatures not dropping much below 10 or 11 degrees. But further north, there will be some brighter spells and that will allow temperatures to drop into the low single figures. So a chilly start for Northern Ireland and parts of Scotland with some sunshine widespread across these regions in the morning. Through the, through the afternoon, though, that band of rain pushes its way eastward. So some sunshine developing for much of England and Wales later as well. There will be some showers bubbling up through the afternoon. They could be quite heavy in places, but another very mild day. Temperatures as high as 60 or 17 degrees across the south and even for Scotland we could see in the double figures. Monday, a band of rain situated across the UK pushes its way eastwards, leaving a drier day for most of us. Plenty of sunshine through the rest of the morning, but for Northern Ireland, turning much cloudier as we head into the afternoon with that heavy rain arriving. It does then remain unsettled through much of next week with temperatures widely above average for the time of year, perhaps 16 or 17. Looks like things are heating up. Box spoilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. We've got cash, treats and a spring shopping spree to be won in a great British giveaway. You could win an amazing £12,345 in tax-free cash. Plus, there's a further £500 of shopping vouchers to spend at your favourite store. We'll also give you a gadget package to use in your garden this spring. That includes a games console, a pizza oven and a portable smart speaker so you can listen to GB News on the go. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, Text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Nana Queer. Weekends from 3 p.m. So after his mad dash to see his father last week, Prince Harry predictably went on TV to talk about it. He gave his first interview to Good Morning America, whilst apparently being filmed by a crew that were doing a documentary on the Invictus Games. He didn't disclose his father's diagnosis, but frankly, even the fact that he was on TV talking about it was concerning. No wonder they're keeping him at arm's length. This is what he said. How did you get the news that the king was ill? Um, I spoke to him. And what did you do next? I jumped on a plane and, and went to go see him as soon as I could. How was that visit for you emotionally? Um, look, I, 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 love, I love my family. The fact, that I was, the fact that I was able to get on a plane and go and see him and spend any time with him, I'm grateful for that. An illness in the family can have a galvanizing or sort of reunifying effect for a family. Absolutely. Is that possible in this case? Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, you know, I've, uh, throughout all these families, I see it on a on a day to day basis. Um, you know, the, again, the the strength of the, of the family unit coming together. Mm. He also said that he loves his family, but then he said that he had his own family in America. So, which family does he love? The late Queen's last few years of life were marred with accusations of racism, which Harry later backtracked on, claiming that they hadn't actually used the word. So, inadvertently admitting to gaslighting us all. But the Sussex's stock is falling in the States, and the only thing that makes them interesting is their proximity to the royal family. And now the king is ill, Harry has even offered to muck in and take on official duties to help his father. Look, I want to see reconciliation and love and joy, but I'm afraid Meghan has yet to even speak to her father, as far as we know. And Harry didn't apparently even reach out to his brother. Whilst his dad might fall for it, I doubt William will be as soft. Good luck with that, Harry.
Good evening to you. It's 11 o'clock. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB newsroom. Senior Tories have attempted to downplay claims of a Conservative plot to replace Rishi Sunak as Prime Minister with Penny Mordaunt. Reports in the Mail and the Telegraph say MPs on the right of the party would like Ms Mordaunt to lead them into the next election in an effort to avoid, quote, catastrophic losses in the polls. Well, Sir Jacob Rees-Mogg, a former business secretary, has denounced the idea as madness. And Dame Andrea Jenkins who's publicly backed installing a new leader before the election, denied knowledge of plans to anoint Ms Mordaunt in a coronation. And the move would mean a fourth leader of the party in just five years. Sainsbury's has been unable to fulfil the vast majorities of today's online deliveries because of technical issues. Contactless payments in store were also affected, leaving thousands of customers either unable to buy groceries or having to queue for cash machines. Sainsbury says it was caused by an overnight software update. Tesco experienced similar problems, but on a smaller scale. Both chains have apologised to customers and say the unrelated issues have now been resolved. The man elected as the new First Minister of Wales has described his victory as a page in the book of the nation's history. Vaughan Gething won a narrow contest ahead of his only rival, Jeremy Miles, to win the Welsh Labour leadership race taking 51.7% of the vote. He'll also become the first black leader of any European country. Mr Gething's expected to be confirmed as First Minister on Wednesday when a vote will take place in the Senate. He will replace Mark Drakeford, who's held the post since 2018. It means no UK nation will be led by a white male for the first time since devolution began in the late 1990s. Today, we turn a page in the book of our nation's history. A history that we write together. Not just because I have the honour of becoming the first black leader in any European country, but because a generational dial has jumped too. Like Ken and Jane, devolution is not something that I have had to get used to or to adapt to or to apologise for. Devolution. Welsh solutions to Welsh problems and opportunities is in my blood. Drivers in and around the M25 have been dealing with major disruption today as unprecedented closures cause significant delays. Motorists reported miles of tailbacks on the approach to the five-mile closure between junctions 10 and 11 in Surrey. It's the first time the motorway has been closed during the day since it opened in 1986. It will remain that way until 6am on Monday morning for bridge repairs. And Rugby Union, Ireland have retained the Six Nations Championship after beating Scotland 17-13 in Dublin. A try from Dan Sheehan gave Ireland a 7-6 lead at half-time. Another try in the second half from Andrew Porter.